2 Corinthians chapter 1, I'll lead in by telling you that throughout this letter, Paul is going to illustrate some marvelous, marvelous things about the character of God and how his character should shape his people. Today we're going to begin to talk about the God of all comfort. God of all comfort. This is going to be part one, and we'll probably be considering the God of all comfort for a number of weeks here as we dig through a good part of chapter one. Um, now, I hope that you've, uh, that you've given a little bit of time to reading through this book in preparation for this study. If you haven't yet, I would highly encourage you to do it because it'll bring some things into clear context for you, uh, and it'll help you to be well prepared to understand the points that Paul is going to make. Just like we saw in 1 Corinthians, as we lead into this book, we're going to find that only Christ living through a person, living through his children and living through a church, can cause those people to long for the best and to give their utmost, even for those that have done them terrible, terrible wrong. That's what God's love does. So what God's love does in our lives, His love flowing through the life of a submitted, yielded believer causes him or her to always give their brother the benefit of the doubt and seek God's best for them anyway, right? And we're going to find Paul doing just that as we move through the book of 2 Corinthians, what you're going to be able to see immediately as we look at the first number of verses in chapter 1 is that Paul has obviously been comforted by God himself. And then he chose to give the Corinthian believers the benefit of the doubt and then seek to comfort them because of what God had done in his life. And, um, uh, and by the way, he had very little to go on because of the way that they'd treated him. He'd had a bad experience with the church of Corinth, as we saw last week, but he was led by the Lord to love them and to comfort them in this fourth letter that he wrote to them, at least fourth letter that we're aware of. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, would you begin looking with me in verse 1? I'm going to read down through verse 7. We're not going to cover all of that this morning, but I want you to see a, a snapshot of the overall context. The scriptures say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I don't know if you're picking up the theme yet, but you hear a word that's recurring in there. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. Well, the word comfort is a word that we saw over and over, and the word consolation also very similar. The word comfort comes from the Greek, Greek word parakaleo. It's a very important word to know in the scripture. It's one that I've explained before. You should be fairly familiar with if you've been here for any length of time. It comes from two Greek roots, the, the prefix Para, it means alongside, and kaleo, it means to call. And so put together, it means to call someone alongside you. And the usage of that word indicated that comfort and encouragement and, uh, and blessing, uh, exhortation through the scripture would be given to that person who's called alongside. It's the same word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit of God who is the divine comforter that Jesus sent to come alongside his people in his churches so that he might encourage and instruct and strengthen them. Spoken of all throughout the Gospel of John, chapters 14 through 17, um, this word comfort, parakaleo, it's a very important word in 2 Corinthians. 
It's found 28 times throughout the letter. Uh, it strongly indicates to us what the letter is all about. And of those 28 times, it's used 10 times in verses 3 through 11 of chapter 1. Well, I mentioned to you last week, and I already mentioned again, that Paul had a very difficult experience with the members of the Corinthian church and some certain ones in particular. In fact, his third letter, which we went over just a little bit last week, was a scalding letter that led them to deal with a particular individual who had caused him tremendous grief. And he believed that those Corinthian believers would respond correctly when he wrote that strong letter to them. In fact, he went so far as to predict the good response when he talked to Titus, who took that letter to them. And he had told them, I am absolutely sure, I'm confident they're going to receive this, they're going to repent, and there's going to be some, uh, some distinct change that takes place. That was Paul's heart. Now, Paul couldn't wait to hear about the response from the Corinthian church from Titus. And I say that in a literal way. He couldn't wait. And so he actually went across Asia Minor from Ephesus. He went westward over to the city of Troas looking for him. If you know a little bit about the geography, Troas was the seaport in that area, the, one of the main entrances from Asia Minor into the Aegean Sea. Um, and then he didn't find Titus there, and so he crossed the Aegean Sea and he went to Macedonia, went into Europe. He finally caught up with Titus because he just couldn't wait to hear how the Corinthian church had responded to that very difficult letter that he had written to them. Now, even before sending that letter, Paul had chosen to patiently hope the very best in the Corinthian believers. And folks, once again, I want to re reiterate to you, that's the love of God that's shown very clearly through his life. You won't find it anyplace else. It's not found in people of this world. Nobody can conjure up that kind of love. God himself does that in the hearts of his people as they submit to him. He puts such a love and a hope in his people that they don't give up. Specifically, they don't quit believing in the effectual work of Jesus Christ who lives within other believers and the way that he's going to work to sanctify them through his word. It's a powerful instruction to us that we learn to love others in Christ, even when we're treated wrongly, and that we continue to bear the image of Christ, trusting him to do his work. And so in 2 Corinthians, instead of beginning this letter by chastening the people, like his other three letters had done. He began by comforting them. That's the major theme. And so today, we're going to begin to see just a little glimpse into how he comforted them. We're going to look at the God of all comfort over the next several weeks. And today, we're really going to be looking at the character, a little bit about the character of the one who does the comforting. I hope it'll be a blessing to you. And so let's consider how good our great God is as he um, as he calls his people to his side and he exhorts them and he challenges them and he comforts. All right. There's three things that I want to show you from the first couple of verses here. And as I said, I'm not going to go all the way down through verse seven. In fact, I'm only going to go through the first two verses. And I know that's probably not too much of a shock to you today. Um, in fact, we, uh, we just sang a song and it talked about how we ought to be seeking to hear his voice in every line of scripture. All right, and, uh, and that's certainly the case. Every word is inspired. Every word is God-breathed, and it's packed full of meaning. So we could probably just take a few words and make an entire sermon out of it. But we're actually going to get through two verses. So the first thing that we're going to see here as we look at these first two verses, very plainly demonstrated through Paul's words, is that God is pleased to use his people. And please keep that in the context of recognizing the character of the God of all comfort. What do we learn about his goodness? Well, one of the great things about his goodness is that he is pleased to use his people. It's an incredible reality because God could just speak and get his work done. But he chose to use his people and involve them in what he does. Once again, verse 1 says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Isn't it an awesome thing to know that God has a purpose for them, just as he has a purpose for us today? In fact, it's magnificent to know that he had an intended use for us long before we ever knew him, 
In fact, before we were ever even born. Now, we saw on Wednesday evening that God's clear will to which he ordains his children is to be sanctified. That means to be set apart from this wicked world and set apart unto him and to his work. And so listen to the text in what Paul says here. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, knowing that he would respond to the gospel. God had set Paul apart in his mother's womb before he had even experienced birth. Did you know that? The scripture actually tells us that. Paul himself said in Galatians 1 verses 15 and 16, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. That is the purpose for which God had had separated him or had called him or had sanctified him to go and to preach him among the heathen and have Jesus Christ revealed in and through him. Now, as we consider the way that God prepared Paul so that he could use him, little did Paul know that he would be born a Jew. He had absolutely no choice in that matter. It's just the way that he was born into this world. Little did he know that he would be gifted with such an intellectual mind that he could best the Greek philosophers on Mars Hill. Little did he know that he would have a mastery of many different languages. Little did he know that he would have the schooling of a man named Gamaliel, which would teach him the Old Testament like nobody else in the whole New Testament era could have done. Little did, little did Paul know that God had orchestrated some of those circumstances of his life from a long time before he was ever born. Can you just imagine for a moment, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit just conferring together and saying, you know, we need a man to be a preacher to the Gentiles. It's a desperate need in this world. This man, um, we need a man who will appreciate and preach nothing but the cross of Jesus Christ. This man has got to be a Jew because unless he's a Jew in a strict family that carefully teaches him the Old Testament law, he won't appreciate the depths of all the covenants and the promises that are laid out in the Old Testament. We need a man that has a tremendous intellect and that will be able to learn languages and communicate in many different cultures. We need a man taught by one who knows the law better than anybody else because then he, above anybody, can appreciate the message of God's grace. We need a man who will be a powerful writer so that he can pen three quarters of the New Testament. We need a man who will be bold enough to go and stand before anyone, from the lowliest servant up to the Roman Caesar. Now, Paul had no no idea about any of those things. Um, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And I only emphasize those things to to make a a point. It's not to put Paul on some kind of a pedestal. Um, I just wish for a moment here as we enter into this study that all of us could be caught in wonder, love, and praise to God as we realize God's care in preparing us from the moment that we're born into this world all the way up to this very moment to serve him. Do you realize how God places the greatest of care into directing circumstances into your life to give you life in the first place, to keep you safe, to sustain you, to guide you, and to prepare you for the moment that the gospel of Jesus Christ will be delivered to you? Sadly, most people don't realize or appreciate that at all. They're completely blind to it. They're ignorant to it. For those that do receive Jesus Christ, do you comprehend how he did all those same things to prepare you so that you might devote your life to a key area of his service? I wish that every person here could understand the intent that God has for your lives. Have you discovered it yet? Have you discovered it? Have you submitted to it yet? If you walk by faith, which means to trust and to obey the scriptures, God will lead you directly into his purpose for your life. I know this to be a reality. Before any of us are ever born, God does have a particular desire for each person's life. Now, um, God is no respecter of persons. He didn't have 
some high lofty plan for Paul and not have one for every other person that's born into this world. His will is plain and his will is clear in the scriptures. What a difference it would make if believers would stop looking for what they already have been provided in Jesus Christ. People seem like they're always looking, always trying to find satisfaction with um, in things that, frankly, have already been delivered to them. If they would just stop and if they would bow before God and discover the purpose and the plan that God has established for their lives. Now, the will of God for Paul though it included a few different details regarding what part of the world he would minister in, which church he would serve in and through, what some of his particular spiritual giftings and enablements would be. It was really little different than the will of God for any one of us. God's will for every person, according to the scripture, is to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. His will for every person who arrives at that critical decision is to put their past life behind and wholly submit to him and follow him as Lord. And that involves several things. It involves a public demonstration of that faith in him through baptism and admission into the membership of a scriptural church. Once in a church, it involves immersing oneself into being trained and discipled by the pastors and teachers in that church that God has placed there. As that discipleship is received and the person matures, God's will for that person is to be sanctified, which means to be set apart and dedicated to God's service alone. Folks, that involves quitting the things of this world and living for Jesus Christ alone. It involves having Christ formed in them so they represent him well. And as they come to maturity, it involves leading others to that same truth that transformed their lives. In God's goodness, God accomplishes that glorious transformation and he makes a nobody into a somebody who can be used by him. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, as I mentioned last week, It's very apparent through this statement that Timothy had returned from Corinth back to Paul in Ephesus. It's very fitting here that Paul included the name of Timothy because Timothy was there when the church of Corinth had first begun. It meant a lot to the Corinthians. According to Acts chapter 18, Silas and Timothy had arrived in Corinth to see Paul and to assist him. Paul had been in Corinth making tents up to that point in time, making a living. He had been doing a bit of teaching and reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews. But when when Timothy and when Silas got there, he pushed the tent making aside and they focused in on preaching the gospel together. A strong team working for the Lord. As a result, the church of Corinth was born. Paul loved Timothy It was always seen in the way that he addressed him so tenderly in his writings. He called him our brother here, Timothy, uh, our brother. Um, But in the Greek, if you read it, it's actually Timothy, the brother. The, The definite article is used there. And I'd say that's quite a compliment for Paul to pay to Timothy or to anybody. He wasn't just Paul's brother in the Lord. He wasn't just the Corinthians brother in the Lord. He was the brother. He was, he was the example of what a true brother in the Lord Jesus Christ really is. Paul really loved and valued him. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 21, he called him my work fellow. In 1 Corinthians 4, 17, he called him my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. In 1 Timothy 1, 2, he called him my own son in the faith. In 1 Timothy 1, 18, he called him son Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1, 2, he called him my dearly beloved son. And in 1 Thessalonians 3, 2, he called him our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. I'm just, I'm just sharing those things with you um, so that you can see, as I hope, that there was a real connection between Paul and Timothy. They were a team together in the Lord's work. Just as God had orchestrated so many things in Paul's life to prepare him for his service Paul recognized and treasured that God had done the same with Timothy. 
and that he had been a key player in encouraging him and helping him plant this very church. There's an appreciation on the, on the heart of Paul for what God had done in Timothy's life to bring him there, and that led him to treasure him in that way. Even though Timothy's name is mentioned, we do know that um, unlike some other epistles, Paul was the one personally doing the writing of this epistle. And we can determine that because he used the first person um, plural we in this writing all the way down through verse 15. And then in verse 15, he changed it to first person singular, and that carries throughout the rest of the book. He said in verse 15, and in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before. That's first person singular. It's the writer. And then in chapter 10 and verse 13, he said, therefore, I write these things. All right. I'm just sharing that with you just so you have the clarity on the actual penman of this of this letter. Back to the immediate context. It says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And I want to break down a few of these different words that we see here. It's very significant that we understand what he was saying in that statement from the very beginning, the very entry to this letter. First of all, he was holding up his God-given badge of authority before these folks. Now, most people in our day don't like authority very much, do they? Many people in our culture don't like authority. Did you know that many people in Paul's day didn't like authority either? That's, that's just a characteristic of the fallen nature of mankind. But God has always worked through authority. And he has delegated some of his authority to certain people for certain key purposes. That authority isn't owned by the person that's holding it. It's not to be abused or used for personal gain. It is only to be used for the purpose that God intends it. However, that being said... Those to whom it is entrusted shouldn't be bashful about boldly using it to speak for God. And those under that authority should carefully seek to submit to the appropriate God-given authorities. The word submit that's used all throughout scripture literally means to rank oneself under. And so as you look at maybe the hierarchical structure in the military. It is a person who is subordinate in rank. They recognize that and they willfully rank themselves under someone of higher authority. There is a, a submission to that higher authority because of the rank that it carries. A police officer is given special authority by the state to enforce its laws, to protect the populace, to intervene in crimes, to investigate crimes, to effect arrests, to give lawful orders to people which must be obeyed. Then they are empowered to detain and arrest those who refuse lawful orders. Now, how do people know someone is a police officer? Well, one of the most obvious symbols of civil authority in our society is that they carry and display a badge and they carry credentials with the officer's name and the authorizing authority upon them. In a very real sense, as Paul opened up this letter, he displayed his badge. It was something that he, that he didn't typically do in his writings because he didn't always need to do that. In some of his epistles, such as in the letter to the Philippians, he said this, Paul and Timotheus, same two guys, the servants of Jesus Christ under the church of God that's at Philippi. He didn't need to display his authority there because he wasn't trying to correct or enforce anything. And he also didn't have people that were bristling at the God-given authority that he was bringing. They treasured and appreciated that. They submitted to it. In Corinthians, he did display the authority of Christ, which had been entrusted to him. Just like a law enforcement officer, he boldly displayed the symbol of his authority, which indicated his God-given right and responsibility to discipline, to challenge, to protect. I mentioned last week that his authority as an apostle had been questioned and attacked. There were some in the Corinthian church who wanted to live the way that they wanted to live, and they couldn't stand it when Paul looked them in the eye and boldly commanded, Brother, thus saith the Lord in a doctrinal area or in some practical area. Now, Paul's going to particularly come back to this 
and defend his authoritative God-given apostleship from chapters 10 through 13 of this letter. He spent four chapters out of 13 in this letter defending his apostleship because it had been severely attacked. So we can say it, it forms a major theme in this book. Now, it's important to understand that Paul was not defending himself. He was defending God's channel of authority. And as he did that throughout this book, what we're going to find is that he's going to speak in a very strong and authoritative way that's not typically seen in his writings. Don't take it as arrogance, though many people don't like authority very much. And many people in our society bristle at authority. They bristle at the police officer for telling them something, even if it's for their good. It's also very appropriate for spiritual authorities in a church to speak strongly and to speak authoritatively for the good of the recipients, and they need to listen and submit to it, all right? And so when we see the strong usage of, uh, of some different, um, uh, different teachings and such from an authoritative standpoint, understand what Paul is doing in this letter. So in that first verse, when he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, uh, buckle your seat belts because he's getting ready to really put the pedal to the metal and speak very authoritatively in this letter. Now, uh, I'll emphasize once again in passing that there are no apostles today like the apostles in that day. We have the written scriptures now in its completed form. Those apostles were the ones through whom God spoke to give it to us. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 tells us specifically our faith, that which we believe, it's built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. We don't have those kind of apostles today and we don't need those kind of apostles today. Anybody saying that they're an apostle in the same sense that Paul was are simply not telling the truth. Now, um, not only can nobody today fit the qualifications for an apostle that are laid out in the Bible, God used the apostles and the prophets to lay the foundation. We don't need to go back and rebuild the foundation. It's already there. However, even though we don't have apostles like that, we can say with all certainty that when the word of God is preached or it's taught or it's shared, the full force of his authority still comes along with it. Back to my primary point here, and we'll move on. God was pleased to use Paul to write the words of Scripture that we have today. God was pleased to use Paul and Timothy as his vessels to the Gentile churches. How do we know that it was God's pleasure to do that? Well, it says once again that it was by the will of God. And let me very briefly explain the word will before we move on. There are two words that are translated into our English Bible as will in the New Testament. One Greek word is bolomai. That refers to a demand. This one that's used here when it says that it was, he is an apostle by the will of God. It's the Greek word thelema. It's an expression of pleasure. It's that which brings joy to God. It brings pleasure to God. It is what God took great pleasure in brought God great joy to give Paul the authority of being an apostle in one of his churches and equipping him for that purpose and then sending him to go and speak for him. Now, isn't it interesting that the very thing that brought great joy and pleasure to God displeased the Corinthian believers the most? That's sometimes the way it is. People need to get their minds fixed so that they are pleased by that which pleases God. God loves to draw his people into what he's doing. He loves to use his people. It's a remarkable thing that he can use us at all. It's almost unfathomable that he would take pleasure in using us for his purposes. But that's who he is. Delights him when he finds a willing vessel through which he can do his work. So let me ask you a question. Are you being used of God today? Are you allowing God to do through you what he wants to do? Do you acknowledge the goodness of God's character in wanting to use you as undeserving as you are in what he's doing? Do you recognize the way that God has led you through your life to the point that he can speak to you right here and right now 
about this matter. God is pleased to use his people. The second thing that we can see as we consider God's character, God's goodness as the God of all comfort, um, is that God is purposeful in locating his people as well. He's pleased to use his people. He's purposeful in locating his people. No one is where they are by strict chance or by accident. How many of you really understand that today? It's the pleasure of God to use his people, and in so doing, he plants his people where he wants them so they can affect the world around them. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints which are in all Achaia. I want you to remember that Achaia was the southern part of the country of Greece. We learned here that the letters written by Paul were read by all the churches in the region, not just the Corinthian church. They were his primary addressees, but they were designed to be circulated and for others to read and benefit from as well. When it says, with all the saints which are in all Achaia, the word saints refers to all the believers in that region. And by the way, some religions claim that they can confer sainthood on people. <laughs> not so. Absolutely not the case. A saint is one who has been sanctified. It is the root word of the word sanctified. And uh, the word sanctified means that one is set apart to God's holy work. No man can do that. No religious organization can do that. God alone can take a person whom he has cleansed separate him out and set him apart to do his holy work and be used by him. And by the way, God puts them wherever he wants to put them. In the case of these saints, we find that they were strategically located by God all over that country. Now, of course, the church of God, which is at Corinth, was not the only place where God had his people. Um, there were uh, we're just inferring this, really. There were other churches all over the country, and we know all over the world, each given a mission to reach their part of the field for the Lord. Romans chapter 16 and verse 1 spoke of the church at Sincrea. Acts 8, 1 spoke about the church at Jerusalem. Chapter 13 and verse 1 spoke about the church at Antioch. There were churches at Philadelphia and Laodicea and Pergamos and Thessalonica and Samaria and Philippi and Rome and Lystra and Iconium and Troas. And we could go on and on and on talking about the different churches that are noted throughout the New Testament. Many other locations, they were located as well. What's the, the critical thing to understand? Whenever there were people saved in a particular area, then it pleased God to set them apart to serve him in a church so that they could be matured and protected and engaged in his work. That's always the pattern of the New Testament that we find. It's a work of God, and he's most pleased to lead people that are willing to believe in him to a sound scriptural church, which can help them to grow and to which they can make the necessary contributions that that church needs so it can be strengthened to serve him better. It's a wonderful, wonderful synergy between the two. Think about God's personal engagement in this. It's not random chance that people end up in certain churches. If they're God's people and they're submitted to his word, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 makes it plain that the Lord added to the church. The Lord did it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28, it says that the Lord set in the church. And then it named a number of different individuals. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, it says, God set the members, every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. What I learned from all of that is that God is personally, um, dynamically involved in leading his people to the right churches and plugging them into those bodies so that they can perform the functions that he wants so that they can be um, so that they can grow they can mature and they can serve the way that he desires uh, folks I, I don't know I, I don't know about you but I, I perceive we really take this for granted it's easy for people to just say 
well, I'm just going to pop out of here and go move to this location or that location. And, and there's nothing, um, uh, I wouldn't put any kind of, uh, any kind of r serious restrictions on anybody. I, we just have to go to what the scriptures teach. But it is the Lord, it is a work that he is involved in, deliberatively engaged in that process to plant people in certain locations to serve him. He locates people where they need to be. He leads them to the churches that they need to be in. And they should appreciate it deeply and make the critical contributions that it pleases God for them to make. God takes great pleasure in using them, but he takes great purpose in locating them and placing them in areas where they can work for him, where they can influence people for him. Now, every one of these words is packed full of meaning. You should never hurry over a verse or think that it's trite or just a meaningless introduction in scriptures. It's not just a simple shallow greeting that we're looking at. I hope that you get that already. The Greek word for, uh, for church is ekklesia. The prefix ek, it means out from among something. The Greek word kaleo, it means the called ones. The people in a church have been something in the past, but they've been called out of it. And they have been assembled together into something new created by God himself. Started by Jesus Christ himself during his ministry. That word ecclesia, it's never used of a pagan religion in scripture. It's only used for God's assembly whose members have been called out of the world and into a local body of believers in Christ. It doesn't mean that they aren't to be in the world still. It means that we're not to be of the world any longer. The world is certainly not to be in them. I was just visiting with a missionary, a missionary up to um, uh, off the Steese Highway last week, and he was sharing a quick little story about how he was fishing on the Kenai River in his little boat, and, uh, and things were going great as he was fishing, and then all of a sudden a couple of big boats went by and left a, a huge wake that in about one second's time swamped his boat. It was about a foot underwater before he could even do anything about it, and so um, anyway... Uh, that, that I'm not going to tell you all about the story other than to say this, that a boat in the water is by design. It's designed to be that way. But water in a boat is disaster. It's ruinous, all right? And that's the reality when we talk about God has called his people out of the world and into local churches. And, and uh, if it gets backwards, if it gets the other way, like we've seen in 1 Corinthians, where the, that church had allowed Corinth to get inside of them, then it's a disaster. When he called them the church of God, which is at Corinth, it reminded them very clearly that they came out from among the Corinthian lifestyles. Yes, God had located them in that city. He wanted them in that city, but he didn't want that city in them any longer. They were called out, but they were still to be a presence there, shining the light of the gospel in that dark community. And so how do we apply this? Well, friend, it's no accident that you are where you are right now. No accident. If you're a child of God, God is purposeful in locating his people where he wants them because he desires salt and light in those places. That's why he strategically and masterfully located us right where we need to be. I can say that with all my heart for my own life. Are we blooming where we're planted? People are often chasing some imperceptible purpose by moving around all over to different places, thinking it's going to give them something worth living for when it's found in realizing God's purpose and locating them and serving right where they're at. Now, I want to emphasize, it doesn't mean that you may not need to move as God directs you to get into a good church somewhere. It doesn't mean that God may not choose certain individuals to go out and preach the gospel and plant churches in places where there are none. But otherwise, appreciate the value of serving in a scriptural church and make a difference where you're at. Are you making a difference where you are? Right in your community? Are you realizing that God's purpose is to use you in a powerful way where you're at? 
Have you, have you asked yourself, why am I here? How did I get here? Was it accident? Was it happenstance? Or was it divine purpose that God put me where I am? That God led me to where I am? That God added me to this church body? Well, God is pleased to use his people. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, and, and so was Timothy, in serving in those ways by the pleasure of God. And God is purposeful in locating his people, and that included the people that were members of the church at Corinth, as well as the other assemblies that were scattered all over Achaia. And third and finally, we can see that God is passionate about enabling his people. Folks, this is the goodness of God on full display that we see in verse 2. This is who we serve. We don't receive him and then just flounder along without direction or assistance. He enables us. Paul said in verse 2, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace are two of the most important words in scriptural vocabulary. Grace is a huge subject. I can't even scratch the surface of it in just a moment's time. But it comes from the Greek word charis. I'm not pronouncing it right. I'm not going to try to do the Greek pronunciation. But it refers to a gift that flows from God himself. All spiritual blessings emanate from the source of grace who is Jesus Christ. Everything that we need for life and godliness is found in that one word. Now the believers in Corinth had already received the grace of God which bringeth salvation. We know that. We studied that for, what, a year and a half in 1 Corinthians. We know that they were saved folks. He had said back in 1 Corinthians 1, 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. So he wasn't talking to them about receiving saving grace. They'd already been blessed with that greatest and most undeserved gift of all. But grace is not only that which saves you, but it is that which transforms your life. Now, once Christ, the source of grace, is in us after salvation, he wants to live his life through us. In fact, it's accurate to say that he wants to replace us. His grace ought to live in and through us from that defined moment on forward, we're going to find in this letter that it is his goal to transform us daily from glory to glory. That's the statement that's made. It was something that they should live out having been transformed by his grace at salvation. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 describes it this way. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then Paul said these classic words. Don't miss this. I do not frustrate the grace of God. The word frustrate means to nullify it. It means to render it powerless. God wants to enable us so that he can use us. We can nullify that use. If we don't live wholly submitted to him and allow him to live through us. For the Corinthians, though they were saved, they needed the grace of God to go on. They needed it for salvation, but they needed to have its enabling to walk in obedience to him and learn to let him replace them as they displayed his image or the image of Christ through their lives. Paul said that he was determined. He was determined not to set aside, not to nullify, not to frustrate the grace of God being lived in and through him. Did you know that you can do that? You can frustrate the grace of God in your life. He continued on with grace and peace. Have you ever observed that peace always comes after grace in the Bible? Never comes before it in the scriptures. Until a person has submitted to the grace of God, there can be no peace. That's true in salvation. He deals with your sin and transforms you, and then you have peace. Peace that passes all understanding. It's also true in the life of a believer. When you walk in discipline and obedience to him, peace saturates your life. No unsaved person will have peace until they receive the grace of God, the gift of God. 
through Jesus Christ. No saved person will have peace until they live in the grace of God. Peace only flows through the life of a person who's living and walking in God's grace. Now, since we studied 1 Corinthians together, we understand, uh, understand a bit about the power of that statement, I hope. Those people knew how to frustrate the grace of God. They knew how to set it aside. They knew how to not live in it. In these first two verses of 2 Corinthians, we're able to see a tremendous amount about the goodness of God. As we continue through this chapter in the following weeks, we're going to see that um, God is the God of all comfort. He's so good to use his people. can't tell you how many times I've just been overwhelmed just by the shocking reality that God would even choose to use me in any way. Now, I have no doubt of this. The only folks who aren't enjoying these verses are those who are sitting there thinking, I'm not about to let God use me. That's how you frustrate the grace of God. Some may be amongst us, and you haven't realized before why you're here. God's beginning to say to you, it's not an accident. It's for a clear spiritual reason. I've put you here for a specific purpose. I located you right where you are. Don't you move unless I relocate you somewhere else that I want you to be. You're here to be salt. You're here to be light in this community. And God will equip you and enable you to do what he wants you to do. You'll just submit yourself to him. And so as I wind down, let me ask you just a couple of simple questions. First of all, what is God's pleasure for your life? My friend, it's only realized as you walk in obedience to God's truth. As it's revealed to you in the scriptures, that's the only place that it's found. Don't frustrate the grace of God. Secondly, are you appreciating where God has located you? Allowing him to use you to impact those around you with his truth. Don't frustrate the grace of God. Third, are you living in the enabling power of God? Are you carefully informed about it through the scripture so that you're conscious of it, so that you're following hard after it? Paul said in Philippians that he wanted above all else to be found in him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And then he said this, I follow after. That is, uh, that, that's what I am pursuing with all my focus, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He was talking about similar language to being arrested, right? And he said, I have been arrested by Christ so that I can go and, uh, and follow after, or apprehend or arrest that which he has laid out before me. And he said, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Are you experiencing that enabling power in your life? Well, we find that Paul had been wronged by the Corinthians in the past, but he was thrilled with their response in one small act of obedience to the Lord that he had heard about. And now he made a deliberate choice to write to them to comfort them. And now they had to make a choice, just like we have to make a choice. Are we going to bemoan the place where God has put us? Are we going to frustrate the grace of God by failing to submit to him? Or are we going to submit and appreciate that he wants to use us as vessels to touch a community that's desperate to know the very things that we're hearing about today in this room? So many people think of missions and involvement in missions as overseas, and that's certainly a part of it and something that we ought to be involved in, but it's also right across the street. And we've got an opportunity, if we can get in touch with the incredible understanding that God takes pleasure to powerfully use us right where he has planted us. That was the heart of God. That was the heart of Paul, even to a church that had really given him a hard time. And so he began these first two verses to focus them on the God who is behind all the comfort that we're going to be looking at together in the next several weeks.
Are you allowing God to use you? Is this community different because you're here? What's God saying to you today, this very moment? If you're not a believer, I don't want you to feel left out as we wrap things up today. He calls upon your heart once again today with his offer of grace, with his offer of peace. If you'll humble yourself, if you'll confess your sins and receive Jesus Christ today, you'll enjoy his peace and you'll realize that he has a purpose for you too.